Hi, everyone. This is Nancy Buteau. Welcome to today's Ticket to Work WISE event. We have a very exciting agenda for you today, and uh, we are thrilled to have so many people on the line. Uh, looks like right now the numbers are climbing to um, over 350 attendees. We have over 1,300 people registered today, so obviously um, we have a lot of interest in our topic and are very happy having so many people on the line. Uh, this afternoon we are going to be talking about working for yourself with Ticket to Work, achieving financial independence. And you can manage your audio using the audio option at the top of your screen. It will look like a microphone or a telephone icon. All attendees will be muted and we encourage you to attend by choosing Listen Only from the audio menu. This will enable the sound to be broadcast through your computer, so please make sure your speakers are turned on and that your headphones are plugged in. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer, or if you prefer to listen by phone, you can dial our toll-free number, 1-800-832-0736. And the access code is 845-8462. For webinar accessibility, Real-time captioning will be provided during this webinar. The captions can be found in the captioning pod, which appear directly below the slides you are looking at. You can also access captioning online by going to http colon forward slash forward slash www.captionedtext dot com forward slash client forward slash event dot ASPX question mark customer ID equal sign eight four six ampersand event ID equal sign three zero seven Five seven six zero. For questions and answers, please use the question and answer pod to submit any questions you have during the webinar, and we will direct those questions accordingly during the Q&A portion to our speakers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a wonderful agenda today. We have a lot of people that are watching and listening. Um, so I will say this several times. We probably will not be able to answer all of your questions today, uh, but we will be giving you resources, and we will be telling you where you can go for more information, as well as trying to get to as many of those questions today. If you are listening by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may also ask questions by emailing questions to webinars at choosework.net. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available within two weeks on the Choose Work website at https colon forward slash forward slash www.choosework.net forward slash webinars dash tutorials forward slash webinars dash archives dot html. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the question and answer box to send a message, or you may also email webinars at choosework.net. 
So I am your moderator today, Nancy Buteau, filling in for Jamie Pendergraft. Uh, I am also with NDI Consulting. We have some wonderful presenters today. We have Colleen Moynihan from New England Business Associates. And we also have Marlene Uliski with the National Disability Institute Consulting. So I want to take a moment to welcome them and talk to you about introducing how Social Security can help you succeed at self-employment, ticket to work, and work incentives. We are going to talk about why choosing self-employment may be best for you. We are going to hear from the New England Business Associates Business Development Center. We are going to give you a lot of self-employment resources, and we are going to be also um, having several question and answer sessions so we can try to get to as many questions that you have as possible. So we are going to move into first the Ticket to Work program, and we are going to be hearing from Marlene Uliski, and Marlene, as I mentioned, is with National Disability Institute Consulting, and Marlene has worked for the Social Security Administration in the past for over 35 years, so she comes to us with a great deal of knowledge and experience. Marlene. Marlene. We're in Florida, We're in Florida. And, and she has developed she has expertise, developed expertise in, in developing, developing relationships, relationships with partners with across partners Florida, Florida to educate them educate on the them disability on the programs, programs administered by, by the Social Security the Administration. Administration. After leaving After the Social Security the Social Administration, Administration, worked with the Florida, Florida Office, Office of Vocational of Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation to establish the Partnership Plus program under the Ticket to Work program. And she was rehired by the Social Security to conduct training and to assist managing critical integrity workloads. At National Disability Institute, she is part of the training and technical assistance team and provides and support, provide support to her colleagues her and to beneficiaries when Social Security Administration issues arise. So without further ado, arise. Marlene, I would like to so, turn it over to you. Ado, Marlene, I would like to turn it over to you. Okay. I hold on just one okay. second. I'm having a little bit of technical on. difficulty. I'm, I'm not seeing the slides. Okay. 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 Now I see them. Very good. I apologize for that. Um, I'm hearing a slight echo. I'm hearing a slight echo. I'm here this morning to talk, or this afternoon to talk about um, the different types of disability benefits a person may receive. And I'm going to start out with talking a little bit about SSDI benefits. And SSDI is Social Security Disability Insurance, and that pays benefits to persons with disabilities who, who have actually paid into the trust funds or paid FICA taxes. And benefits are payable not only to the person with a disability, but sometimes it's payable to members of the family as well. Um, so in addition to having a disability and meeting the insured status requirement, that means they paid in enough money into the trust funds, they work long enough and recently enough that they were insured, um, they may qualify for a benefit under this program. This program also pays benefits to what's called um, childhood disability benefits, or you may have heard it referred to before as disabled adult child benefits. And that's a benefit payable to someone with a disability. Disability began prior to age of 22. And they have a parent who is either deceased, retired, or disabled and filed for a benefit. Um, with this program, there's no income or resource requirements. That means that a person could have 
as much money in the bank as they wish, and it doesn't affect their benefits. And with this type of a program, Medicare entitlement comes with that generally after two years or after a 24-month um, waiting period. Um, the easiest way to know if you're receiving this type of benefit is when you receive the benefit check. If it is on the third of the month or on Wednesday, either the second, third, or fourth Wednesday, you're likely receiving a Social Security Disability Insurance benefit. Now, before I go on to SSI, you may be asking, you know, why do we always start out with this information or why are we providing you with this foundational information? And the reason is there's different work incentives that apply to the different types of benefits you may be receiving. So if you're receiving SSDI benefits, there may be specific work incentives or specific rules applied to your benefits when you go to work. And when you receive SSI benefits, there are different rules. And there are some that pertain to both programs. So that's why at the beginning of the presentation, we try to provide you with the foundational knowledge so that you know what type of a benefit you're receiving so that you know which rules may apply to you. So we're going to back up one second and talk about supplemental security income benefits. And supplemental security income benefits, um, that's a program where benefits are payable to a person with a disability, and the person may not have worked enough or recently enough or paid enough into the trust funds or paid enough FICA taxes that they're not insured. They may have worked just a little in their lifetime or have a spotting work history or just worked intermittently, or maybe their impairment didn't allow them to work consistently. So a person like that, if they have limited income or limited resources, they could possibly qualify for supplemental security income. And supplemental security income is a needs-based program, or sometimes we say it's means-tested. So it's meant for persons um, with little income or little resources. Um, this year, um, the maximum amount payable for an individual receiving SSI is $733. Um, as you know, there was a cost of living increase, and that is going up to um, $735 um, in January of 2017. And some folks actually um, may be receiving benefits under both programs. They may be receiving Social Security Disability Insurance benefits and Supplemental Security Income benefits. And you'll hear that referred to as concurrent benefits. That means that a person um, has worked and they paid into the Social Security system. They paid FICA taxes and they were insured. And maybe their benefit isn't that high, though, so it's low enough that Social Security can supplement it with Supplemental Security Income benefits so long as they meet the income and the resource requirements um, of Social Security. So folks like that, they actually have Medicare that comes with the SSDI program and Medicaid, which comes with the SSI program. So they may have both benefits. So why choose work? Um, choosing work is a big decision for, for everyone. Um, but as you see on your screen, there's a lot of reasons why folks choose work. Some individuals, some persons may want more income. May their Social Security Disability Insurance benefit or their SSI benefit is low, and they need to supplement that by working. Others may want to become a little more independent. Um, maybe um, you are a younger person and you want to move out of your parents' household, or maybe you want to purchase your own home, or um, maybe purchase a new vehicle. There are a lot of reasons why folks choose work. Um, another reason is meeting new people. Um, I know that some of my best friends are persons I met on the job. And by working, too, it's not only meeting other persons on the job, it's meeting other persons who come to your job because that could lead to something, um, another job or a better job in the future. Choosing work also 
could lead to learning new skills. Um, you may receive some on-the-job training, training to do new things. You may um, sharpen your interpersonal skills. You may gain some computer skills and so on. And down the road, um, that also can help you to even get a better job. And uh, Nancy, could you advance my slide? It is not advancing for me. Seems like the connection I lost, but it's. I apologize. Hold on for one second. I seem to have lost, I, I, I think, the connection. Hold on. I apologize. It's, I'm, I'm seeing a circle, and hold on for a minute. It's loading the Adobe Connect again. I apologize. Sure, while well, you're reloading, Marlene, this is Elizabeth Jennings. Let's keep going. And sorry, everybody, okay. I'm guessing the giant moon just had some uh, results on our technology today. So let's talk about taking the next step. Uh, first, I just want to say for a moment, I'm really impressed that so many people are on the call today. It lets us know how important it is to you to think about returning to work and to explore what you're able to do, um, even as you're dealing with all of the different issues related to your disability and the other impact that this may have had on your life. So you did a great job by showing up here today. And this is going to be archived for you if some of these tech problems have kind of thrown you off just a little bit. So what we suggest is that today is a great start. We're going to give you a lot of resources so that you can start to gather information and start to plan your journey toward employment. The Ticket to Work um, a Ticket to Work and Work Incentives Improvement Act is just one piece of the process for you, but it's going to help to provide you with a lot of the tools and supports that you need, including the Ticket to Work program and Social Security work incentives, so that your journey can be as smooth a one as possible. So as you sit here today and learn and then have more questions as you think about what you've learned today and you start to uh, think for yourself about the path that you're designing for yourself, we want to make sure you know where to turn for help. It's the Ticket to Work helpline. So to call them in, uh, through voice, use 1-866-968-7842. And if you're using TTY, the phone number is one 866 833-2967. The Ticket to Work helpline is going to help you with more information about the Ticket to Work program, how to connect with employment networks. Those are the service providers that are going to provide the supports you need as you go down this employment path. And they can also help you to better understand the impact of work on your SSDI or SSI benefits, which is a really important component of all of this. If you need more support than the Ticket to Work helpline is able to provide in regards to your benefits, then they'll connect you with um, certified work incentive counselors who are folks in your local community who are certified to support you in understanding benefit rules. 
If you're not sure you need to talk to someone just yet, but you want to gather some more information for yourself, and maybe look back on some of the other WISE webinars that have taken place to gather more information, you can visit www.socialsecurity.gov forward slash work. And I want to actually um, suggest that we uh, give you www.ssa.gov forward slash work. I clicked on the socialsecurity.gov today and it rerouted me. So let's not have you rerouted. Let's send you to www.ssa.gov forward slash work. So Marlene, do we have you back that you might want to talk about these work incentives? Elizabeth, I am back in, but I can't see the slide. It isn't opening up for me. Okay, no problem. So it's, it, it's just voice. I apologize. No problem. Okay, so let's go through some of the work incentives today that uh, apply to some of the, the, the self-employment rules that we're going to talk to you about. So Social Security has several work incentives to make self-employment easier for you. It's something that Social Security recognizes may be the right path for individuals as they return to work. So they have specific work incentives that are designed to help you um, access some of the money you're going to need to start your business, help with other expenses, and also let you earn and save money. So here's the work incentives that we're going to talk about. Property essential for self-support, which is available under SSI, and unincurred, unincurred business expense, which is available through SSDI and SSI. The property essential to self-support we'll talk about first. This work incentive allows, allows you to save unlimited funds in a small business operating account. And how that account is set up can be very important. So you're going to want to do this with some support from, uh, with some benefits advisement. The dollar value of the equipment and tools needed for employment or self-employment is not counted towards SSI or your Medicaid resource limit of $2,000 for a single adult or $3,000 for a married couple. So what this is saying is that you're allowed to save money in a business account and Social Security understanding that you're going to need some capital for your business. The money you have in that small business operating account is not going to count against the resource limit that you have as somebody who receives SSI. So this is a way for you to save money towards operating your business without having to worry about the asset limit. The next work incentive is the unincurred business expense. Unincurred business expenses are contributions made by others at no cost to you towards your self-employment business effort. So there are a few examples of this, and some of you might want to think of your own as we talk about it. One might be a vocational rehabilitation agency gives you a computer to use in your graphic arts business, or a family member works for your business unpaid. Now, I imagine some of you on the line have operated businesses before, so you can likely think of examples of how you had contributions made to your business that were very, very impactful for you, but really didn't cost you anything. Those are the kinds of things you want to think about. And um, you know, we, we're also mentioning here vocational rehabilitation, and we're going to give you a little bit more information about supports like that in just a, just a little while. So the unincurred, unincurred business expense are the contributions made by others at no cost to you that support your self-employment business effort. For an item to qualify, it has to be an item or service that the IRS would allow as a legitimate business expense if you paid for it and someone other than you must have paid for it. So that gives you a little bit more information. And like I said, we're going to want you to do this with folks who are knowledgeable about the self-employment rules. Social Security does not deduct unincurred business expenses from your earnings when your SSI payment amount is calculated. And I'm sure for some of you on the line, that leads to some additional questions about, well, how is my SSI payment amount is ca calculated? And while we're not going to go into all of that today, these are the kinds of questions that it's really great to jot down as we're talking today so that you can bring them forward to the Ticket to Work helpline or you can do some exploring on your own before you make those calls. So these items to qualify, again, they have to be a legitimate business expense under the IRS rules, 
and someone other than you must have paid for it. So why would you choose self-employment? Self-employment may be right for you if you want to meet your work goals, uh, supply your own accommodations, transition from benefits to financial um, independence, and seek opportunities in different fields of work. Uh, again, I believe many of you on the line have probably thought about self-employment for quite some time. It what it's what brings you here today, almost 500 of you. Um, and if you're new to self-employment, please, as I mentioned, write down your questions in the chat box. Let's make sure we put them forward to our speakers so that we can get as many of them answered today as possible. I'm not going to hand this back to Nancy so she can introduce our speaker for the day. Thank you. Great, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to our next slide, we do have several questions that came in. Um, so I'm going to open it up to some questions so we can try to get some of those answered. And um, I will let uh, either you or Marlene answer those questions. And the first one is, how can I find out what type of benefit I am receiving? OK. Elizabeth, I can answer that if you would like. Um, the easiest way for you to find out what type of a benefit you're receiving is to telephone the Social Security Administration at 1-800-772-1213, and they can tell you what type of a benefit you're receiving. Or if you are conducting other business in the office, and if you are doing that, it's always to have an appointment so that your wait time is limited. Um, they can tell you what type of a benefit you're receiving at that time. Another way you can find out what type of a benefit you're receiving, particularly if you are thinking about going to work or if you are working, is by telephoning a WIPA, a Work Incentive Planning and Assistance um, Grantee. And the folks who work for these projects are called uh, CWICs, or Certified um, Community Work Incentive Coordinators. You can find the um, the, the name and the telephone number for the WIPA project, which serves your area, by telephoning the Ticket to Work helpline or by visiting the Ticket to Work website at www.chooseworkttw.net. Great. Thank you very much. And we have another question, um, which is, where can I find more information or resources on Social Security Administrative work incentives. OK, and um, that also, um, you can find that information through the Social Security Administration again. Or another good resource is their website, um, www.socialsecurity.gov. Another good resource is the Choose Work website. Again, that's www.chooseworkttw.net. On the Choose Work website, there's a link at the top which takes you to the Social Security website and to the Red Book. And the Red Book is a really good resource which provides information on a variety of Social Security work incentives so that you can take a look at it and see how many work incentives you can actually use when you choose to work. Um, another good resource is as we talked about a little bit earlier, is the WIPAs, the Work Incentive Planning and Assistance folks. And they can provide you with a lot of good information, too. But it's always best, I think, before you even contact a WIPA or visit Social Security, is take that first step on your own and maybe visit the website and see what's out there, see if you understand the information that's there, and then telephone or visit. Great. Thank you very much, Marlene. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. And one of those is, if I am self-employed, can I also use other work incentives, like the student earned income exclusion or impairment-related work expenses? And that's, that's another great, great question. And Social Security, um, the Social Security Administration really wants you to work. 
and they encourage individuals receiving either Social Security disability insurance benefits or supplemental security income um, to work. And they provide so many different work incentives that you can use whether you're working as an employee and receive a W-2 or if you're self-employed or if you receive a 1099. So some of the work incentives you can use if you're employed are impairment-related work expenses or the trial work period. The student earned income exclusion is a fantastic work incentive. Um, plans for achieving self-support. There's just a wide variety of work incentives that you can use. You can use more than one. You don't, you don't have to limit it. That's great. That's knowing. That's wonderful knowing that, that people can use more than one work incentive at a time. And we're going to take one more question before we go on to our next speaker. And that is, what if I have my own business and I'm working from home? Can I use Ticket to Work for self-employment from home? And that's a great question also. Um, yes, you can. No matter where you're, whether you have a business and you have a storefront or you work out of your house, yes, you can work, use Ticket to Work. And yes, you can use other work incentives as well. Um, working from home is really great because for many persons with disabilities, sometimes it's hard to keep to a certain schedule, particularly um, if you have if your condition worsens periodically. Um, so self-employment really, really is a good option for persons with disabilities when they would like to work, but they're not really certain whether or not they can sustain employment you know, each and every day. Working from home is a great option. Great. Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. This was some great information. I would love to keep asking some of our audience questions, but um, I would like to move on to our next speaker. So um, having said that, I am happy to introduce Colleen Moynihan. And Colleen is the Program Director of the New England Business Associates Business Development Center. Uh, she's been in that position since 2008. And she assists individuals in planning and implementing their business concept. She is responsible for the Ticket to Work program and also for PASS plans, plans to achieve self-support. Colleen has had over 25 years' experience with two Fortune 100 companies as an executive in marketing and strategic planning, and she has served on three boards as an advisor on federal re regulation and legislation. She has had her own business uh, consulting firm since 1991. Uh, Colleen, thank you so much for being here, and I am going to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, near and dear to my heart, and I think something that I hope you are interested in pursuing, and that the information we share today will help you have a little more confidence in taking that step. But who is New England Business Associates? We go by the acronym NEMA, and as you can see, we are an employment network. And you can find more information about us uh, in the Find Help tool located on the ChooseWork.net uh, website. There are many ENs across the country that can also help you with your self-employment goals. Some of them may have not done a lot of work in this area, but they have the information and they have the tools that can help you understand, as was discussed earlier, the kinds of benefits that Social Security provides to assist you in developing a business. NEBA's mission is to enable people with disabilities to be fully included in the community, primarily employment, and self-employment is one form of employment. We currently serve a wide range of individuals with skills, abilities, and stress who are between the ages of 18 and 60. This key, however, to our working with anyone who's interested in starting a business is, one, is this a feasible or practical business idea? And number two, what will it take for the 
ticket holder to be able to run this business. So what we do is we try to spend time interviewing the ticket holder so that we can make certain that the thing you are interested in doing is not only feasible, not only practical, but that at some point will also generate the have in order to be self-supporting. All of the individuals with whom we work in our program, that is the primary goal, that we're trying to assist them to move forward in a real competitive business. Our self-employment positions and our business plan approach does not fit for trying to assist someone to make a hobby more profitable. So when you are looking at trying to develop a business, we're going to ask you to be very clear on your idea. And if you can't really figure it out, we'll help you. We'll then work with you to write the business plan. But what we realize, the plan is only a tool. It's like a hammer and a tool case. You need to be able to use that plan to implement your business. So we will work with you with up to three years to get that business off the ground. So what are some of the things that you will be doing in this business plan? And why write a business plan? I'm sure most of you have heard of Bill Gates, who started not have a business plan when he got started. He had an idea. And he became able to develop that idea to the point where he needed to move to the next level. And at that point, he needed a business plan. And what was that next level? Develop funding resources to get him to the next level. So in the business plan that Bill Gates did and then the one that you are going to do, you have to have a statement of the goals, the business goals you hope to attain, a plan for reaching those goals. What many people do when we meet with them, they, oh, I have a business plan, I've written it. And when I look at that business plan, they have, in fact, written about their goals. They have a plan for getting to those goals. But they do not have any financial projections. A valid business plan must have three-year projections of what you think is going to cost to run that business. And you've got to have three years projection of revenue or income that that business will generate so that you can demonstrate that there will be profit, there will be something for you after all operating costs are paid so that you have something to live on. There is also in a business plan, in addition to the business background, a marketing strategy or a marketing plan that you will be using to get your message out. Here's something interesting, and you think about it when you're um, riding around town. There are a lot of businesses, and when you look at them, they all seem very different, and they are. There may be a PC repair business. There may be a cleaners. There may be a gas station. There may be a grocery store, a doctor, a dentist. All of these businesses have a different product or service. Every single one of them have a business plan. The business plan for one bit kind of business to another is exactly the same. You must have your business goals, you must have your marketing plan, and you must have your financials. And we at NEBA can help you do that. The NEBA BDC, Business Development Center, therefore can help you develop your business idea. We'll help you write it, and we'll help you implement it. It's a common thing for me to sit down and listen to someone talk about their vision, their idea, and help them move that to a place where they begin to see for themselves that, oh, yeah, this is really what I'm trying to accomplish. And this is where I need to go to either provide that service or sell that product. So for you, whatever you have right now as a vision is the starting point, and we can help get you to the next place. That is 
is our hope anyway. So do we do this? Let's take your idea. Let's get those finances done because the finances tell the story. That is the exciting part of a business plan. And all of you sitting out there, oh, numbers? I hate numbers. We, we will you find that those numbers are your best friend. They are the things that help you know whether you are succeeding, why you are succeeding, how you can succeed more, and the things you have to do in order to move that business to the very next step. And for all of us who are trying to, in fact, move into that next step, having support that you would get from developing your plan with an organization and employment na network like NEBA is critical. So you can work with someone from NEBA. You can also work with other organizations in your area that have a lot to do with developing businesses, such as a SCORE office. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Anyone who does get accepted into our program based on, it's usually because there is a very strong possibility their business is going to succeed and that they are willing to make a commitment to NEBA's program requirements. For most of you, it simply means that you need to have access to a computer and an email address. Now, when we start with folks, they probably have email addresses that are pretty interesting. And you may be asked to make a bit, an email address that's a little bit more professional, more intuitive, and recognized as a business. We talk about a computer because a business does need to run off a wide range of uh, materials. Sometimes if you're a restaurant, you may have to run off menus. If you are a website designer, obviously, you're going to need a website to help other people create theirs. And that is only possible for a computer. And I make this point because many people today think that a tablet is going to be all they need. And that is misinformation. You need to be able to have a computer, a laptop, either one, and you must be able to do word processing and do spreadsheets. So you have to have software that does have Excel and Microsoft on it. Many times you can work with your vocational uh, rehab office to acquire these tools so that you can then move forward to do a business plan. Your conversation about what expects in developing a business plan must be completed within 60 hours or six months, whichever comes first. Most people complete their plan between three and four months, and that is usually the norm. But some folks have to have different pace. That's one of the wonderful things about doing your own business is that depending on your situation and your flexibility to get things, you're going to be able to accommodate the process with your own individual approach. If you do not complete the uh, plan within 12 months, uh, we will have to figure out what it is we have to do to help you move forward a little bit more effectively. Since 2009, which is when we started keeping track, we've been in doing this since 2007, we have the work for a lot of people. And we've had 241 people participate in the program. And I'm going to tell you, when I did these numbers, these numbers are greater now than they were the day I did this because we are always having new people come into our program. And that, therefore, is a, a number that was there probably a month and a half ago. We have completed 110 business plans. Well, since then, I know we've completed five more. 
So we have about 115 business plans that are completed. That is a number that is also rather um, interesting. We have statistics, so we know that we get about twice as many people inquiring to our program than actually finish it. And those people who do not complete a business plan, we have been able to develop skills for them. That means that they can go on and find better employment than they might have had had they not gone through. So our experience is that most of the folks who come to NEBA to look at self-employment may not end up writing a business plan or having a business but they do have the ability to take on uh, employment in an area they may not have considered in the past. And they are able to be fully employed and sustaining some level of income that will, again, help them to get off of their benefits. We currently have 13 plans in process at this moment. By the end of this fiscal year, for us, which is June, we probably will have written about, oh, I'd say 25 plans. As of this time, we have created 33 new jobs. That doesn't mean that it's the business owner. We're talking about the fact that some of the businesses that we have started hired people. They have employees. So you may have a business idea that as we develop it, here you need to hire someone to make to get to that next level of running your business. So this is not just about writing a plan. It's about building opportunity. It's being an economic engine in your community. One of the things that you may not have paid much attention to is the importance of small business in the economy of the United States. We always think about big corporations employing hundreds, if not thousands, of people. And we hear about these corporations many, many times laying off people. And you wonder, my gosh, what do those people do? Well, some of those people who get laid off, some of them start their own business. But there's another, a bigger sector of the economy, much bigger, that is the result of all of those small businesses that you see as you drive around where you live, those cleaners, those PC repair shops, those stations, all of those places hire people. And you, as a small business person, may work out of your home or you may work in some setting outside of your home where you have employees. Do you know that it's even possible to work out of your home and have employees because you provide a service that they, your employees, can be working with customers in the community? So this is the, the double blessing of self-employment is that you find work for yourself and you help to create employment for others in the community. You heard me say a few minutes ago that one of the goals that NEBA has when working with an individual in the area of self-employment is that we off of their Social Security disability benefit. We, in the process of doing that, we work very, very closely with CWICS. You heard earlier today about working with a WIPA working with a certified work incentive counselor, we require that all of our people do that. I should stop and tell you that we work with people across the United States. We are currently in about 39 or 40 states in the United States. We work with people from all kinds of businesses and in, in, in all kinds of settings. But we do require that they meet with a CWEC in their community and to stay connected with that CWEC. We also help them work with Social Security in their area because when you are employed, as you know, it's also true for self-employment, you have to submit information to 
NEBA, or the Employment Network, and to Social Security about the revenue and work activity that you are doing. CWIC helps you understand the impact that's going to have on your Social Security income benefit and on your health benefit. Those are two distinct benefits. They work on independent tracks. And while your income benefit may change with Social Security, many times your health benefit does not change. So again, it's that relationship that you have with the CWIC through your local work incentive and planning uh, office that will assist you in knowing what's going on for you. So in front of us on this slide, we have what we call our STARS. They are moving off of their Social Security disability benefits to becoming fully, fully sustainable on their own. And you can see they come from all parts of the country, Georgia, Massachusetts, Colorado, Illinois, Michigan. We have folks in Washington State uh, that are also moving off of their benefits. And we continue to work with those individuals once they are off their benefits. As I said to you earlier, we will work with you for up to three years because we want to make certain that your business is going to be successful, that you will be able to continue to support yourself and your business as you move forward. So how do you get more information from NEBA? Well, you can go to our website, which is www.nebaworks.com, or you can check us out at NEBA, excuse me, ticket at nebaworks.com, and we can, we'll return your, your, your email and give you the information you are interested in. You will also find a phone number there that you call to get more information. And you can follow us on Facebook at w.com forward slash NEBA works, N-E-B-A. W-O-R-K-S. Um, and you can also, I want to talk a little bit about some resources that are very, very important to us. Everybody here, we've talked about CWIC. They're sort of your ticket to work mentor. The person who helps you understand what your benefits are and your circumstances and relationship with Social Security. But we have other resources that we like to talk about in terms of the support that NEBA gives. We have a very important one, the Service Corps of Retired Entrepreneurs, or SCORE. It's a nonprofit program that is supported by our federal government. It is a program of the Small Business Administration. And most communities have a SCORE office in their community. These individuals provide free services we've talked about today are free to you under the Ticket to Work program. And you're going to end up with a business plan that is based on a SCORE business plan template because they work with people across the country in terms of helping start businesses. We happen to specialize in individuals who happen to have a disability. And so we work closely with SCORE. Once your plan is done, we're going to connect you with a SCORE mentor. So you now have two mentors to help you directly in your community to get your business flourishing through SCORE. And you will continue to work with NEBA to help you work your way to self-sufficiency and ease yourself off of Social Security. And those two mentors, the NEBA mentor and the SCORE mentor, will provide ongoing business support that you're going to need to be as successful as possible. We've already talked about the WIPA program. We feel very, very much strongly that without WIPA, People do not succeed to the extent they could. We know this because in the first couple of years of 
doing this program, we did not work that closely with our WIPA people. Once we started doing that, we were stunned at the level of success that our ticket holders were able to attain because they had the information that was specific to them, important to them, and a place to go where they get all of their questions answered in a timely manner. So as you can see, we are really believers of that process. And you've heard it before, you can go to the Choose to find the help you need. If you have any problems with getting the information for your area WIPA, NEBA is very happy to provide that information for you. It's as simple as a phone call, and you have that information um, in these slides. Another great resource is the American Job Center. They used to be called one-stop um, centers. They help individuals who are looking for both employment and sometimes in writing a plan. But they have resources there that will help you in the kind of information you need that will help you in identifying maybe even clients who might be helpful for you in developing your business. It is a free service, just as SCORE is a free service, just as the program that we're talking about today is free to you. The other resource that we have is the Small Business Development Center. Every state in the United States has a Small Business Development Center. The problem with them is that they are they tend to be affiliated or located in the state university. But they are out there, and it is a resource that you can gain access to uh, very, very easily um, through maybe you have an extension program in your area that is part of the university program. But they do have a website, www.sba.gov. SBA stands for Small Business Administration which funds both SCORE and SBDCs. So it's www.sba.gov forward slash SBDC. For any Colleen, other I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you there because we have oh, okay. so many questions. <laughs> OK, I am, I am ready to take them on. All right, we've got, um, thank you so much. Your enthusiasm is wonderful and this information is wonderful. Um, one of the recent questions that just came in when you were talking about SCORE was, what does SCORE cost? It's free. It's free. It's free. Everything that we've talked about today is free. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then another question we had is, can somebody work with you? you with NEBA and vocational rehabilitation at the same time? No. Um, Ticket to Work is a one user time only. So if you are working with your vocational rehab um, agency, continue with what that program is. And then once that has finished up and you've closed that case, you can call us or an, any other EN who offers uh, business plan support. And then we can start working with you under your ticket. Okay, great, thank you. So that leads perfectly into my next um, question about a business plan. Um, somebody said that they need help with a good business plan, and is there a, a ticket to work coordinator that can can help to get that support? I did. I didn't hear the whole question. You cut out. Oh, Could I'm you sorry. The question. Sure. Um, a person needs assistance with a good business plan, and is wondering if a, there's a ticket to work coordinator that can assist with getting that support in writing a business plan? Again, uh, Ticket to Work um, works with the ENs that provide small business plan development. The Social Security Administration itself does not have a coordinator per se. So an EN like NEBA can help you. And as I say, there are other ENs across the country. You can get that information again on the Choose Work website, 
which will show you an EN in your area if there is one that does do uh, business plan development. Or you can call us, because we do work across the United States, and we have been doing that for many years now. And we work with all kinds of folks in all kinds of businesses. And we will work with you for up to three years. Up to three years, wonderful. Um, great, thank you. And another question, we've, we've got lots of questions for you, is um, how can I get help for business startup costs? <laughs> Forgive me while I laugh. Uh, <laughs> that's a, I'll tell you how. Uh, first, you've got to write a business plan. No one will give you any financial assistance unless you have a business plan. And it has to have those three things we talked about the business background, the marketing plan, and those wonderful numbers that many of us go, ugh, about. But you got to have them. So once you have that business plan, then you can uh, consider going to your local lender and getting financial assistance. However, it's important that you understand that most lenders expect a business person seeking financial assistance to have been in business two years. Do you remember my saying earlier about turning in your wage stubs or turning in your earnings that you get from your business? Well, what I didn't add is that you need to also, when you are starting your business, you have to start reporting taxes. You have to fill out a Schedule C you have to submit that to the IRS because that lender is going to want to see the tax returns for the last two years. So if you haven't been filing, you have nothing to show. Now you may say, well, I may not make much money, and by the time I get my expenses paid, there's nothing left. And you know what? That's true. However, you can show that on a Schedule C the bank or the lender, they're but they want to know, number one, have you filed your taxes? And number two, what kind of development of revenue from year one to year two is going on with that business? The only document that they will usually accept for having being the truth is a tax return. So it's that two years of being in operation. And I tell everybody, the minute you start doing a business, even though you don't have a plan and you're not planning on getting a plan yet, start saving those receipts. Keep track of what you earn and file a tax return. I love it when someone comes in and they say, I want to start a business. I've been doing it for a couple of years. And I say to them, have you filed your tax return? Yes, great. You're going to be able to get some funding. A PATH plan is another way to get some funding indirectly. And a PATH plan takes too much time to explain in this particular session, but it's certainly something you can go online and see what a PATH plan is. There are some interesting uh, ins and outs with it, but you can certainly um, consider that as a way to get money. Wonderful. Sorry Thank about you. the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's a fan great information. Um, we have several people asking um, uh, about age questions and age requirements. Um, can you talk a little bit about the age range um, for NEBA? And is that the same age range for ticket holders? Our age range is a little different, and I think you caught that. We tend to work with people up to um, age 60. Uh, the reason for that is if I start a business plan when they are 60, it's, they're going to be moving into uh, allowable retirement age at 62, 60, you know, and up. And so that uh, means that we would, they probably would do that, and we, we can't support them at that point. So um, we do not generally work with folks um, who are over the age of 60. There may be some exceptions, but at, that, this, at the current time, we have found that that it just doesn't work. We we used to do it, but they ended up just um, all of a sudden just vanishing. And we are a limited resource, and we want to help people 
who are going to be able to really have a business for their community. So. Okay. I and know some of them won't like that answer, but I, you know, it's, it is what it is. Thank you. And yet another question for you, Colleen, is does NEBA work with people who receive SSI or SSDI or both? All the above. All the above. We work with anyone who is under the Ticket to Work program. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and then I have, an, I have plenty of questions um, for you. I'm going to ask you one more, and then I'm going to go back to uh, Marlene and Elizabeth. We've got a couple questions there regarding the first portion, and then I still have a few more follow-up questions for you, Colleen. Um, but right now I'm going, oh, well, I'm going to ask you this one question first, which is can you turn a hobby into a business? Always. Always. That's the best kind of a way to start a business. And um, on top of that, um, I guess I, I will ask one more question. Um, some people are saying, have you ever worked with an artist? Uh, so I guess a lot of people has art, have art as a hobby. One of our areas of specialty is in the area of art, writers. We happen to be quite, we have a, we have a special discussion group on our LinkedIn for our writers. And we have done, we have uh, quite a number of artists. Uh, I'm working with an artist right now who just won a grant so he can support himself to do some shows and, uh, in the spring next year. Oh, yeah. We do a lot with art and, um, of any kind and with writers. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask you just to um, bear with us. And I'm going to go back to um, this question was for Marlene, and uh, the question was, what kind of services uh, do vocational rehabilitation offices offer? Nancy, could you repeat that question? Sure. The question is, what kind of services do vocational rehabilitation offices offer? Well, vocational rehabilitation offices provide a wide variety of services. Um, to persons with disabilities, they, they, they do everything they can to help a person with a disability to become job ready. So that means testing them to see what their interests are po possibly, um, maybe looking at their past work, looking at what's available, um, seeing whether or not there are any needs related to their disability, um, possibly discussing training or on-the-job training or support a person they need. Um, some of the vocational rehabilitation projects provide benefit planning services similar to what a work incentive planning and assistance grantee offers. Um, there's just a wide, wide variety of services with regards to self-employment. Um, they, a lot of the VRs, what I've seen over the years, they really think outside of the box. And they look at you as a person and what you can do, and they focus on what you can do and not what you cannot do. And that's really, you know, what you need, particularly if you're thinking about work and you're thinking about employment. You want someone on your team who can help you to move forward. So there's, it just depends. I would encourage you to contact your vocational rehabilitation office in your area and talk to them. Um, all of them conduct orientation sessions. They provide you with information on what services they pro provide and what are the next steps. And many of the uh, vocational rehabilitation services, once they help you and once you're working, they participate in a program under the Ticket to Work program called Partnership Plus where they work alongside employment networks who can also provide you with some follow-along services um, once you are working. So contact VR. Very, very good resource. Great, Marlene. Thank you for that. Um, so you just mentioned also an EN. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the difference between vocational rehabilitation and an employment network? Well, um, prior to the Ticket to Work legislation, there was basically one place where persons with disabilities could go 
to be provided with the services they needed to help them to become job ready and to find a job, and that was vocational rehabilitation. But when the Ticket to Work program started, the um, pool of providers has increased substantially where providers under contract with Social Security, they're called employment networks, some of them joined in to provide services. And what that did for persons with disabilities is provide them with more choice on where they go for the services they need. So some individuals may choose to go to VR because they're interested in maybe um, training or education or something along those lines, but others may um, feel that maybe a smaller employment network may be able to work with them a little better. Maybe they just need something like some um, supports on the job or the purchase of um, something, a small piece of equipment or something to keep them working. So. Both provide services. Um, vocational rehabilitation provides a lot of different services. Employment networks, some of them provide a, a wide variety of services, but some provide just focused services or services in a particular area. And when I say that, I'm saying maybe services focusing on a person with a specific disability, or maybe an employment network um, focusing on just providing transportation services or supported employment services or something along those lines. It's really good to shop around, to look at vocational rehabilitation and look at employment networks. And when you're thinking about working, um, call the Ticket to Work helpline or visit the website and um, look at all of the employment networks and vocational rehabilitation and look at some of the services they provide to see what's best for you. All of them will have a telephone number listed. You can telephone them to discuss what they can do for you um, because you, you want to take that next step. You want to get ahead and you have to do what's best for you and look out for yourself. Thank you, Marlene. And, um, here is another question. If I am self-employed, do I get credit for my work on my Social Security number? Okay. And that depends. It actually depends. Um, when you are self-employed, I assume you will be filing a tax return, as you should be filing. And it depends how much you're paying into Social Security. Um, remember a little earlier when we talked about some of the foundational knowledge and we talked about SSDI benefits and you, may, you had to have worked recently enough and long enough to meet what they call an insured status requirement. And we didn't really go into that very much, but what that is is you're paying Social Security taxes and for every, oh, I'm trying to think of the number off the top of my head, um, it's, uh, let me think, oh, next year it's $1,300. So for every $1,300 you're earning, you're accruing one credit or what they call a quarter of coverage. If you're an employee, that's gross. If you're self-employed, that's net. So for every $1,300 net you are earning and claiming on that tax return, you're getting one credit, and you could get up to four credits a year. So when you're working and you're self-employed, you are paying your FICA taxes. Um, you will be on your way, if you're on SSI, receiving an SSI benefit, you would be on your way to becoming insured under the other program, the SSDI program. And if you're already receiving SSDI programs, you're paying more into the system. And what that can serve to do down the road is additional earnings are posted on your earnings record. It could actually bump up your benefit just a little bit when the computers do what they call recomputations. So it's a good thing when you're working, you're self-employed, you're filing your taxes, um, there is a benefit to that. Thank you very much, Marlene. We greatly appreciate your expertise. Um, I am going to go back to Colleen. We've got um, a few more questions that are coming in. And um, the first there is, can NEBA assist with developing a nonprofit business? Yes. That is still a business, uh, even though the tax code calls it a nonprofit or a not-for-profit. It is still a business, 
it's just that its relationship or its structure relative to paying taxes is different. So we do both. And we have found that for many individuals, for example, with developmental uh, challenges, that a nonprofit sometimes can be a wonderful tool to assist that person in becoming more self-sufficient. Wonderful. Thank you. And somebody else asked if NEBA will help them in acquiring an already established business. Um, when you're trying to purchase a business, that's really a dollar transaction. Um, if you need a business plan to get that loan, I think that is where we could be of assistance. Um, there are that's a little bit more uh, than it is uh, writing a business plan, which is what we specialize in. I would strongly, if you need to have more information on that, uh, you can reach us by going to our website, and we have to have a little more in-depth conversation. Great, wonderful. Um, and then for uh, individuals that you've worked with in the past, is there a general time frame between um, planning to actually implementing um, and running a business? When I say implementing a business, I mean you're running it. <laughs> uh, and the, the difference would be um, how long it takes for all the pieces to come together so that you, you've done the plan and then you've got to start putting the pieces together. Uh, so it's the minute you get that plan done, you're implementing and you're running it. For many folks, they've already started running it, especially if you bring a hobby to the table and you want to build it to a business. So uh, yes, implementing and running are often happening concurrently. Thank you. And then uh, another question is, um, how does the Social Security Administration view self-employment in terms of evaluating earnings? They approach it the very same way that they would employment. Uh, with one difference, uh, you as an employee have, uh, you get paid for services rendered to an employer. You as a self-employed individual, oh, and I should add one more thing, and the employer submits all of your earnings information on a regular basis, and so it goes to the IRS and so they can track you. A self-employed person is very different. Um, they have to submit, if they're wise, uh, quarterly uh, information so that they can be paying their taxes quarterly and uh, tracking their revenue quarterly. That's why at the end of the calendar year you should start to plan on paying your taxes for that year because all of that information has been submitted to Social Security quarterly and now you're going to bring the, all those four quarters together on the tax return using the Schedule C so that they can see how you should be taxed for your income tax. And that's why you will see for Social Security Administration, if you're self-employed, they tend to look at people who are self-employed some a little more critically sometime around May, June, in that time, the latter part, after the first quarter of the year because the assumption is they have a tax return now to look at your income and see how you're doing relative to your Ticket to Work program. There is a little difference, and it's a little bit more, um, the timeline is a little bit different, and it does require a little less, uh, a, a little less week to week or month to month charting as you do when you're employed. But again, that's why you need to be in Gata CWIC because it all comes together somewhere around June, July, August that they begin to see how you rate on the ticket to work, trial work period. Nancy, could I add something to that? Sure. Okay, and what I wanted to add to that is um, when someone is self-employed, um, Social Security looks at it just a little bit differently in that they're looking at net self-employment income growth self-employment income. So what that means is your gross, 
is how much it's made, and your net is, after all of your expenses, what your um, self-employment or your profit is. And they actually look at that. And if someone's receiving SSDI benefits, Social Security um, always um, it gets a little more complex. Sense project for some of the information that you need because you always need to do what's best for you. You need to know the facts up front um, and you don't want any surprises. So, but one thing to keep in the back of your mind is Social Security is actually looking at your net, not your growth. So that's really, really important. And I'm going to add, and that's why you do a Schedule C because your net will be on the Schedule C and that is what they're going to use. Mm -hmm. And the way, way it actually does work, too, is um, once you do file your tax returns, I can't stress the importance enough of filing a tax return because once that tax return is filed with the IRS, the computers at the IRS talk to the computers at Social Security, and that information, your net income, is brought over to your specific Social Security number or your earnings record where it posts on your earnings record, and it gives you credit for that work you're doing. So I just can't stress enough with about um, filing those tax returns also. Great information. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a few more questions before um, I go ahead and finish up our, our last slides. Um, and these can actually, I think, be, be answered by any of our presenters. So um, I will let you all decide that. Um, one of the questions, and this is a great question, most new businesses have a loss at the beginning of operations, and do I still need to report um, to the Social Security Administration that I'm working um, even though I'm not making a profit? I can take that one okay. and then others can jump in. The answer is yes. <laughs> I mentioned to you that you would be reporting to the Social Security Office and there is a form that they have specific to self-employed uh, ticket holders. and what you're just going to do is to show them, because remember what was just talked about, your net earnings from self-employment, we call that NESE, N-E-S-E, -E, because they're going to be tracking that on a more, um, uh, you know, I would say casual basis, because they're going to be looking for that tax return ultimately. And there are other things that we haven't talked about also when you have your net earnings from self-employment, you also can apply in some circumstances some of those work incentives that were talked about earlier too, which will bring that taxable income down or more so, so to below zero, to zero. So having a zero net income or net earnings from self-employment is not a, a bad thing. The IRS allows uh, for three years out of five for not making any income for a new business. Okay, and then I'll, I'll just add to that also, Nancy, that, um, yeah, it, it really, really is crucial that you always report to the Social Security Administration if, even if you are um, having, if you have zero as net income or you have a loss. And it's particularly important to those folks who receive an SSDI benefit because even though they may have had a loss. They may be working significant numbers in the business, particularly particularly when the business is starting up, where those months actually may be construed as working a trial work period month. And there's nothing bad about that, um, because during a trial work period month, you could earn any amount of money and still receive your check, or you could have that loss and you still receive your benefit check. But it's really important to um, report it timely to Social Security so that they have everything in the computer and so that their determinations 
on your work activity are accurate because, again, you don't want any surprises. You want everything to be current in the computer. You want it to be up to date. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, all right, so I, we have more questions. Unfortunately, we are not going to be able to get to them. Um, thank you all very much for your patience in terms of uh, trying to get to as many questions as possible to our audience. Um, what I'd like to give you each a chance to do, um, and I'm going to go with Marlene, then Colleen, and Elizabeth, if you could just um, you know, give us a 30-second, uh, a you know, what would be your advice for, for next steps in terms of motivating people towards self-employment? Marlene? Okay, put the timer on. Okay, let's see. Well, the first thing I want to say is for all of the beneficiaries who are on this call today, I applaud you for taking that first step because it's a big step and choosing to work is a very big step, particularly if you've been out of the workforce for a while or um, you're just deciding you want to work again and you're not certain what you can do um, or whether you can work full time again or part time, but you've taken that first step so I, I pat you on the back and I applaud you for that. I think the second step should be probably, if you can, doing a little bit of research or talking to the Social Security Administration just to see what work incentives there are out there. Um, their website is very good, www.socialsecurity.gov, and you can get to the information you need from the Choose Work website. Um, that's www.choosework.net. And from there, you could find the Red Book. And the Red Book has all of the information that you'll need, just as foundational knowledge, so that you know what work incentives you can or can't use. And then I think the next step should be, your third step is calling the Ticket to Work Helpline. And I think the Ticket to Work Helpline at 1-866-968-7842 You'll be able to ask any questions you have, and they will be able to refer you to where you need to go to take future steps. So all of those, those four steps actually, are big steps, but you've taken, I think, the biggest step ever by participating in this webinar today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlene. And uh, I'm actually, I want to make sure that we get to our next, um, our final slides. So thank you very much for that. Um, Please remember, everyone, uh, that at the end of this presentation, um, a survey will pop up. Please uh, take the survey. We love to get feedback from you. Uh, for more information, you can call the Ticket to Work helpline at 1-866-968-7842 for voice and 1-866-833-2926. For TTY, or as you've heard several times, visit uh, www.socialsecurity.work forward slash, I'm sorry, .gov forward slash work. You can connect with us. You can like us on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash choose work. You can also follow us on Twitter, www.twitter.com forward slash choose work SSA. You can also watch Ticket to Work videos on YouTube at http colon forward slash forward slash www.youtube.com forward slash choose work. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn, https colon forward slash forward slash www.linkedin.com forward slash company, forward slash ticket, dash two, dash work. And lastly, I want to remind you to please join us for our next webinar, which will be Wednesday, December 21st, from 3 o'clock to 4.30. Thank you very much for joining us. And in order to register for that, please go to www.choosework.net forward slash wise or you can call 1-866-968-7842 for voice or 